The audio content presented here dates back to the inception of my podcasting journey, spanning up to over a decade ago. Please note that the views expressed in this content reflect an earlier version of myself. As my perspectives have evolved over time, so have I. Listeners are encouraged to approach this material with awareness of its historical context. And now, on to what you've been waiting to hear. So, last week we talked a little bit about some experiences that Peter had One of them being him fishing at the beginning of the Savior's ministry, and the second him fishing at the end of the Savior's ministry. I'd like to talk a little bit about Peter and something that happened to him towards the middle of his ministry. Today I'd like to talk to you about the Holy Ghost. And the reason I picked this subject, I was recently on an LDS discussion board where a gentleman who him and I have had conversation back and forth on this board was trying to make the statement that we ought to seek the Holy Ghost, and that in doing that, that would resolve a lot of the members who have faith crisis. It would resolve their issues. And I tend to agree with him. I do think initially when we find someone who's having a faith crisis, we need to answer their questions. We need to show them that they can slow down and work through these things. But eventually they have to be converted to the gospel. Otherwise, there's another faith crisis just around the corner. So let's begin in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. Now, when you hear Peter's name mentioned, or the name Simon, which was what Peter's original name was, put your name in that place. So here's the scripture. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now wait a minute. Consider what Peter had experienced up to this point. The things he had seen, the things he had heard, the experiences he had been part of. Now, looking back at this scripture, think about this. In other words, here's what the Savior was saying. Peter, you have seen miracles at my hand beyond imagination. You have walked with me. You have partaken and experienced with angelic beings by my side. In spite of all that, you are not yet converted. But I love you, and I have prayed for you, that in the meantime, while you figure it out, your faith will not fail you. Then, once you are converted, I mean truly, really converted, then go and strengthen your brethren. Now, compare yourself to Peter. Have you had the experiences he has had? Have you seen the things he has seen? Have you heard the things taught from the lips of the Savior that he has heard? You haven't. And yet many of us as Latter-day Saints would say, we said, are you converted to the gospel? We'd raise our hand and say, yep, I'm converted. The question is, are we really truly converted? And we need to be careful when we answer, for Peter thought he was too. To be converted is to be born again. Nothing other than being truly converted will give you the strength to stand when the world stands against you. When everything is at odds against you and you are called to lean on your faith and that's all that you have, do you have faith sufficient to get you through these trials? To be born again, we must receive the Holy Ghost. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Water, baptism, Spirit, Holy Ghost. Too much focus in the church is on what team we're on. Many people want to stand up and glory in the fact that they're a Latter-day Saint. We've become relaxed in our spirituality because we found his church. But perhaps we ought to be more concerned with finding him. Many of us are content with spiritual fuzzy feelings from time to time. And we believe this is what the gospel peak is all about. We concluded that this spiritual growth is the end, and it doesn't get any better than this. We just have to maintain it. But one cannot enjoy the rewards of the gift of the Holy Ghost unless one goes through the process to receive him. Have we received the gift of the Holy Ghost? Many have not. Why? Because we lean too heavily on ourselves, finding a comfortable path, content with a warm fuzzy feeling each time we draw close to a spiritual truth yet not pushing on to the real blessing of receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost this is an excellent point 
my friend on this discussion board, as we were having this discussion kind of back and forth, and he was sharing a lot of these points, and I've asked for his permission to be able to share these, and I do think they make an excellent discussion on the Holy Ghost. But often in the gospel, any time we get close to a principle of truth, the Spirit bears witness to us of the truthfulness of what we're, what we're running into. And many of us stop there. We walk away at that point. We don't, we don't delve into whatever that spiritual topic is enough, spiritual topic is, enough to make a drastic change in our life. I mean, it's one thing to have the Spirit witness that tithing is a true principle. It's another thing to have this life-changing spiritual experience where you are absolutely wholeheartedly committed to paying tithing, regardless of what challenges arise. So, knowing that, John 16:7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you a truth. It is expedient that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now here's the question. Why can't the Holy Ghost be present with the Apostles while the Savior's with them? I, I don't know the real answer to that. But one of the, the things I thought about as I pondered on this scripture is that to truly receive the Spirit, these apostles had to exercise faith. Faith that they were incapable of exercising as long as the Son of Man was in their presence. But wait, but wait, you might say. We have had hands laid on our head. We have already received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, Elder Bednar, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, had this to say. The ordinance of confirming a new member of the church and bestowing the gift of the Holy Ghost is both simple and profound. Worthy Melchizedek priesthood holders place their hands upon the head of an individual and call him or her by name. Then in the authority of the Holy Priesthood and in the name of the Savior, the individual is confirmed a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And this important phrase is uttered. Receive the Holy Ghost. Now, brothers and sisters, the simplicity of this ordinance may cause us to overlook its significance. These four words, receive the Holy Ghost, are not a passive pronouncement. Rather, they constitute a priesthood injunction, an authoritative admonition to act and not simply to be acted upon. The Holy Ghost does not become operative in our lives merely because hands are placed upon our heads and these four important words are spoken. As we receive this ordinance, each of us accepts a sacred and ongoing responsibility to desire, to seek, to work, and to live that we indeed receive the Holy Ghost and its attendant spiritual gifts. For what doth it profit a man if a gift is bestowed upon him, and he receive not the gift? Behold, he rejoices not in that which is given unto him, neither rejoices in him who is the giver of the gift. That was from Elder Bednar's talk in the October 2010 General Conference, Receive the Holy Ghost. Now, what we've got to understand is that this is a mighty change spoken of in Alma. This sanctification is becoming Christ-like. This whole purpose in being here and being away from the Father and gaining experience is to receive a mighty change upon us, not a minor change. True conversion is deep. The natural man can change through the merits and mercy and grace of God, but we must be pressing forward with steadfastness to receive it. That said, let's understand some principles. After baptism, we need to be continually immersed in and saturated by the truth and light of the Savior's gospel. You see, sporadic dipping in the doctrine of Christ and partial participation in his restored church cannot produce the transformation that enables us to walk in the light of his love. Rather, instead, fidelity to covenants, constancy of commitment, and offering our whole soul unto God is required if we are to receive blessings of eternity. Total immersion in 
and saturation with the Savior's gospel are essential. So what are the steps to receiving the Holy Ghost? I'm going to leave at the end of this podcast a multitude of uh, talks given by leaders within the church that if you'll listen to each of them, you will notice common themes. Some of those I will not talk about here. Some other things that are not things that they mention, I do want to speak about, and there will be some overlap. But this process is simple, and generally there's about four or five steps that can be taken off in a multitude of directions, but which show our heart and show the effort we're willing to make to receive the Holy Ghost as a constant companion. Number one, focus on being obedient. Follow the Lord, follow the Spirit when it comes to you, follow the promptings that come to you through the Spirit. It's that simple. This isn't about following prophets blindly, but this is about following prophets. When the Spirit bears witness that the things that they say are true, then you have now made it essential that you go forward and do them. If you are rebellious against God, in whatever manner he's speaking to you, whether it is through an earthly servant, whether it is through the Holy Ghost, whether it is through your spouse, whether it is through your neighbor across the street who belongs to a completely different church, or maybe it's your atheist friend at work. It doesn't matter. If the Lord bears witness to you that something is being taught is true and that you need to implement it in your life, you have a responsibility to be obedient to that. So step number one, number one you must be obedient to the gospel, to the Lord, to the Spirit, and to the promptings as they come. Number two, do not do what comes naturally. Sanctification is about being subject to the Lord's will. You see, we're the natural man. We have natural things that we want to do or think or act on or say. It is going against those that we begin to make changes in who we are and become Christ-like. You see, if we just keep doing what comes natural, naturally to us, we will not put off the natural man as Christ commands us to do. So stop doing what comes naturally. Start looking at what the Savior expects you to do, and that may be completely different from what your initial thought process or feelings tell you to do. Number three, establish discipline to live faithful to covenants. You see, we've made covenants from baptism on through the temple. We've made co other covenants with our Heavenly Father in the oath and covenant of the priesthood and other such covenants. Yet many of us fail to live up to them. We understand that is a, it's a big deal in the church to live up to our covenants. And yet many of us do not. And we just think, just like the Book of Mormon says, that, some, that that day will come when the Savior or God will beat us with a few stripes and let us into the kingdom of heaven. And yet this life is about becoming Christ-like. We must keep the covenants that we make with him. Number four, we need to more fully use the sacrament. Too many of us are unaffected by its cleansing power, and we can give lots of reasons for that, but too many of us do not take the sacrament ordinance serious enough. But besides just its cleansing power, do we recognize its changing power? Let's go to a talk given by Elder Donald Hailstrom. Focus on the ordinances and covenants. If there are any of the essential ordinances yet to be performed in your life, intently prepare to receive each of them. Then we need to establish the discipline to live faithful to our covenants, fully using the weekly gift of the sacrament. Many of us are not being regularly changed by its cleansing power because of our lack of reverence for this holy ordinance. Do we see that? Okay, that was from Elder Donald Hellstrom's talk, Converted to the Gospel Through His Church. That was a general conference address in April of 2012. But do we get it? See, the sacrament is not just about maintaining our worthiness and going week to week and just putting ourselves back to where we were so that we can spiritually endure another week. No, the sacrament is an ordinance that allows us to be regularly changed, according to Elder Hellstrom, by its cleansing power. Because of So the ordinance can change us. This ordinance can sanctify us. This ordinance can make us more Christ-like. But we've got to stop and pause and take a long, hard look 
at how we treat this ordinance and begin to use it as a springboard for change. We should plan and focus on the sacrament. We should prepare long before our sacrament meetings start to partake of the ordinance. We should ponder on the atonement, not just the pain and suffering and sacrifice of the Savior. No, but more importantly, the hope and strength and opportunity that this sacred ordinance gives us and that his atonement gives us to change. Number five, prayerfully seek forgiveness for sins and shortcomings. You see, way too many of us sit in the pews on Sunday, having done something in the course of our life that we have not repented fully for. We know it. We're aware of it. It's there. It's there in our, in our, on our shoulder, just whispering into our ear, Someday you can repent of me. Don't do it now. And we put it off. And we wait. And we, and we go weeks and months and in some cases years before we get rid of some of these burdens that we should have gotten rid of a long time ago. We cannot receive the gift of the Holy Ghost until we repent and come unto Christ. We cannot fully come unto Christ by skipping the repentance process. If you have something in your life that is not right, get it taken care of. Repent of it. Quit putting it off. Because until you complete that repentance process, you cannot have the gift of the Holy Ghost constantly with you. You must be clean. It is a spirit. It is a member of the Godhead. And it resides in holy temples. Number six. Think about the promises that you made last week. The promises that you made and the ones you kept. And then this week in sacrament meeting, make new promises. New covenants with Heavenly Father. New, new things that you're going to accomplish and then ask for His blessing on. Number seven, lastly, trust and follow the Savior. I'm reminded of 2 Nephi chapter 4, the Psalm of Nephi, and 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 through 10, where both Nephi and Paul pointedly make reference to the fact that they trust in Christ, that it is through Him that they receive salvation, regardless of their own weaknesses. Trust in the Savior. Trust in His redeeming power. If you do that, blessings will begin to come into your life. These are the blessings that will come as you begin to receive, I mean truly receive, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Number one, you'll begin to sense impressions at a faster pace than you ever have before. Number two, your nature will begin to change, so you will begin to respond to these impressions by being obedient to them something you have not done in the past, and you're well aware of it. Number three, when these blessings come, especially at times when you cannot go forward and be obedient to them at that moment, maybe you're in the middle of work, maybe you are driving in the car, you will make a mental note at least, if not, somehow record and write down these promptings so that you can follow up on them. You'll record them. You'll play, pay close attention to them. They will be taken very seriously by you. Number four, you will begin to hear a voice within you. This will not necessarily be a physical voice, although some people in their interaction with the Holy Ghost have heard a physical voice. But for most of us, this will be a spiritual voice. And trying to focus on the physical senses will not be helpful. If it's a spiritual voice, we must pay attention to our spiritual senses. And as we begin to receive the Holy Ghost, these spiritual senses will will be honed. Number five, we will begin to listen more focused during and after our prayers and in other times when we're interacting with the Spirit. Our faculties, as the scriptures say, will be aroused. Number six, we will begin to engage in a dialogue with the Spirit. We'll ask questions and the Spirit will give answers. So in the process of asking questions and getting answers, there will be this intercommunication between us and the Holy Ghost. It will be a, a, an awesome blessing when this begins to occur. And you will know distinctly that these things are happening. This is when you recognize that you're being sanctified by the Spirit. Number seven, forgiveness. We will not only desire forgiveness, we will not only feel we're forgiven or think we're forgiven, 
we will know that we are forgiven. The Lord has promised us that through repentance, though their sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. We will know that. I have been able to participate in disciplinary councils where when the council was being held again to end the discipline that had occurred, some members would come in and say, I hope I've been forgiven, but, but I don't feel it. Other members would come in and say, I've received a witness from the Spirit that I have been forgiven of the things that I've done wrong. There is a difference. Number eight, our heart and very being will be changed and filled with the Spirit. Number nine, scriptures will become more alive and clear. There will be a clarity of the spiritual voice, and that spiritual voice will increase, and so will the clarity with which we receive to understand it. And number ten, you will begin to teach and preach with power concerning spiritual matters. You will indeed be instructed by the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I'm grateful you joined me today. I hope you received a blessing by listening to this podcast. I hope that you might go forward and make every effort possible to truly receive the Holy Ghost. It is more than just having hands laid on our head. It is more than just going through the motions of receiving ordinances. It is about submitting our will to the will of the Savior. God bless you. Have a great day. And may the Lord warm your shoulders.